Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church here in the heart of a Pendleton summer. But you wouldn't know it, and I haven't seen anything like this. And um, <clears throat> for, uh, for those of you that are prayer warriors, pray tonight. Um, we need what they had in Scripture with Moses. We need a strong east wind blowing all night long. And uh, just something to dry things out. It is just amazing. It's like the heavens opened up. Now, that may seem bad news to you, but I have a little bit of good news. And it may not sound like good news at the moment. The, the, the fire in the Alaskan tundra has crept to within uh, three miles of uh, St. Mary's. But it's also started to rain. And, um, and this is not, was not in the forecast, and suddenly the forecast is turning on a dime, and now they're forecasting rain and snow tonight, and a shift in the wind, and he said, it says, God's done an amazing thing, because the forecast for tomorrow, originally, as only a Florida man can put it, dry as cracker juice, is what he said the forecast was, but now it's completely changed, and and this is good uh, to be able to take care of the fire. So we're grateful for that. So glad to have each and every one of you here. If you're viewing online, you go, uh, Pastor Watkins, is, uh, is ladders a normal part of the stage setup? And the, the answer is, uh, no, they're not, but it just means we're furiously at work. Vacation Bible School is tomorrow, and we are so excited. It is gonna be such a wonderful time, and and, and I look at every single one of you in the congregation right now. I look at all of you, and, and here's what I see in my mind right now, and I'm thinking in my heart. You are all potential setup volunteers right after service tonight. And uh, so anyone who can help, it's, your help's going to be greatly appreciated, and we're excited as we uh, begin to get ready for uh, this year's uh, special theme, which is Let's Take a Walk on the Path of Obedience. And I'm so excited. Uh, tonight I get to write the script for, for two out of the four characters that are involved in the skits. And I'll tell you what, if you see any smoke coming out my ears, it's because I am full of ideas right now. And so we're going to start by singing a, a couple songs, and, and uh, Brother Mark's going to lead us. Let's stand together as we sing. All right, turn to page number 188. 188, happiness is the Lord. and stand. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me in close relation, having a part in his salvation, happiness is the Lord. Real joy is mine, no matter if the teardrops on. I found a secret, it's Jesus in my heart forever. Happiness is to be forgiven, living a life. That's worth the living, taking a trip that leads to heaven. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is the Lord. Okay, turn to page 273. <laughs> I'm so happy. Here's the reason why Jesus took the burdens all away. Now I'm singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin, Jesus took the load and made it peace within my heart. And now I'm singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. I'm so happy, and here's the reason why. 
Jesus took my burdens all away. Now I'm singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin, Jesus took the load and made it peace within my heart. And now I'm singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. And I love that song. I'm glad he went through that a second time because I really needed to, to see that you could sing that song with feeling. You know, especially once my heart was heavy with a load of sin. I just needed to know that you really, you know, felt that load. And so anyway, I was more convinced the second time. You did a great job. And so, good to have Northside Baptist Church here. Southside Baptist Church, you should have been selling ice cream. You should have been giving away ice cream cones today or something. You know, I, you know, I don't know. You guys, you need to get up. Okay, I've got a deacon there. You need to check up on your crowd here and see what happened to them. So, let's have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing on the service here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, for this special day, and we thank you for uh, first-time visitors today, and Lord, so many times these things happen, and they're unexpected, and uh, we're certainly uh, grateful for uh, people that come our way. And Lord, we want to see people encouraged in your word. We want to see the lost come to Jesus Christ, and, and so I pray that you would look upon our hearts for good, especially as we're right on the night before Vacation Bible School and we pray that you would do your drawing work so that children in our area could be saved and know that they have a place in heaven. So I pray that you'd, uh, you'd encourage us through the service tonight and through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm looking here. Yep, you can be seated. I'm going to sing a couple choruses here that are not found in our hymnal. Sometimes I think of something that I've sang all my life and I go, why? Why is this not here? I was, I was almost depressed when I saw obedience is not in the hymnal. That just about put me in stark depression. But the good news is the kids in VBS will be singing that tomorrow. But we're going to sing a couple choruses. Most of you probably know this. First of all is this one. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And so, Pastor, what are the lyrics to that song? I just told you. So, we're going to sing this one through. It goes like this. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Here comes the next part. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand. Everybody ought to know. Here we go again. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. You see, I have a little tag on there, and then there's a fine, F I N E. It means everything's fine. It was supposed to end there. And so now this next one, and we sang this a couple weeks ago after Pastor Paisley talked about how much he loves this chorus, and that is, let's talk about Jesus. The King of Kings is he. Let's sing this one through a couple times. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of Kings is he. The Lord of Lords, supreme through all eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the door. 
Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of kings is He. The Lord of lords supreme through all eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Wonderful singing, great segue into announcements. Again, I only have a few of these invitation cards left. And uh, Brother Carl, I think they're right behind you. There should be a few. Does anybody know where those are? Uh, Mick, I had them. You had a hold of those. Did you pass them all out? Oh, um, they were all passed out, so I am holding in my hand uh, one of the last cards on planet Earth, but I'll let you have it if you want it. And so anyway, Heidi is raising her hand high, and uh, so if somebody can, Benjamin, if you can uh, race up here, you can go faster than Mick, go faster than Mick here, okay? And uh, we'll hand that out to Heidi. I may have one or two more. Uh, in my office, but really we had, oh, Sister Sue has been hoarding them. She has three. Okay, Andrew, do you need one? You have two in your truck? Count them. One, two. Okay. Does anybody else need any? Uh, Carl is wandering around with three of them. If you want to invite somebody to VBS, Mary, uh, Mary, are you thinking of inviting some to Vacation Bible School? Okay, let's give her one. We want her to be able to pass out that invitation card. And uh, Brittany, did you want one? Okay, one back to Brittany, Brother Carl. Uh, Brittany in the back, she's raising her hand, may want to invite a friend to Vacation Bible School, and we certainly want them to invite their friends. Okay, Emiliana has her hand up. She's reserving for the last one here, so Brother Carl, they have to race that direction. And so you are getting a workout today. It's not like you walked anywhere yesterday. Uh, so many of you, and thank you so much. There were, there were 16 people going hither and yon all over Pendleton uh, yesterday, passing out vacation Bible school invitation cards. Thank you so much for doing that. I am absolutely amazed. I, I've never seen you so aggressively eat pizza in my life. I was so stunned, I thought I'd ordered enough. And, and I did, but it still, it was really impressive. Uh, what you did, and, and thank you so much for your help there. And of course, um, uh, really, the work has been going on behind the scenes. Uh, we're setting up um, kind of what we call the Vacation Bible School stage and the Vacation Bible School set. Uh, does anybody have any idea what that might be there? Anybody have any ideas? Just asking the children, what might that be there? Jerusalem? Jerusalem? Um, well, not an old one. Hey, Eli, the celestial city, okay, and that is true, and of course, uh, one of the important things in Vacation Bible School is people going to heaven, and there's going to be a lot more than this after service, and we're looking forward to that, and I am so excited about the Vacation Bible School songs, because I have three or four songs that are going to be new to Berean Baptist Church for a Vacation Bible School song. And so this could be really a whole lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to that. And I'm sorry, uh, I know you want to, but back in 2018 we did, I'm in, right out, right up, right down, right happy all the time. That is not one on the lineup because, um, um, yeah, <clears throat> you know, I am, I am Pastor Mark the Aged, and my back, uh, is not going to put up with that too well, and so I really do not want to do that. But we have some really good, exciting ones, and I'm excited about getting the video done. And, and so anyway, um, any of you were involved, just simple instructions. Again, now, now we have different shuttles that are going to be out all over town. I really want you to pray about this. I have one child uh, that I know of who's going to need a ride who needs to be picked up in the Riverside area every morning. And if there's somebody that can help with this, this is very, very important. We really, uh, Shannon, can you do that? Yes, we really do not want to turn any child away. And so thank you uh, so much for helping with that. 
uh, everything that we can possibly do, uh, we're trying to help with that. Uh, we had a visiting uh, family this morning, a very high likelihood that their children uh, may be coming to VBS. If so, I mean, Andrew, I'm sorry. I mean, at that point, you know, you're pilot. That, there's a really good chance that by the time we get to about the middle week, the Pilot Rock shuttle is going to be full. And so it's just kind of an amazing thing going on. And if it's anything like last year, uh, very often the Pendleton shuttle last year had to kind of do round one and round two. And so we'll see how that works on that. So uh, be in prayer for everybody that's dealing with uh, the shuttles, uh, trying to get children here. Please, please pray for the weather. Uh, pray for the weather to dry out, and, and it's, it's supposed to, uh, but they keep shifting. They keep, they keep moving the line on that, and so just continue to pray on that. Uh, we want our children to enjoy themselves, uh, but we also want them to be dry, and so uh, just to continue to pray regarding that. One of the things that very is exciting is bathroom two is now in operation. And uh, really, it is a fully functional second bathroom down in the fellowship hall. Now, we have bathroom number one back temporarily offline because we're installing a new door on that. But so anyway, but we're really at the finish line of having two functioning bathrooms in the fellowship hall. And that's just a kind of a very, very exciting place to be. And so looking forward to that. If any of you can stay, and I hope many of you can stay uh, right after service tonight, many hands make light work uh, when it comes to getting things ready for vacation Bible school and getting things moved around and getting things set, set up. And, and it's not just simply the sanctuary. About every corner of the church has something that is going to go on, particularly the downstairs. Uh, the downstairs has to be transformed in many ways. And so we're trying to get that ready. And so if you go, I don't know what to do, then ask, uh, you know, ask Mrs. Watkins or ask myself, I guarantee you we can find you something to do. This is not going to be a problem. And just pray. I want you to pray for this. Pray for the health of the workers. This is a critical thing. Pray for the workers' health. Workers need to be strong. For those workers who can do this, and I know some of you can't, this is just the nature of VBS, but for the workers that can do this, get a good night's sleep tonight if you can. Uh, I just encourage you to do that. Trust me, you're gonna need the strength for the week, and so I just want you uh, to be ready for this. Uh, if you can do this, <clears throat> again, we have two things going on. We are now, uh, we're two weeks away from I Love America. And so not only do we have invitation cards now, but we have about 300 posters. Uh, and some, uh, there's a partial stack of those posters out in the foyer as well, and you can get those out. Thank you to those of you who did a mass mailing, 265 mailing addresses uh, that went out uh, this week as well. But just want you to, we have to be getting ready for that as well. And then uh, remember, as you communicate uh, with parents that are bringing their children to vacation Bible school, I think it's important to start early reminding them that there's going to be a vacation Bible school program in the Sunday school hour next Sunday morning. Uh, sometimes um, uh, we get that information out late. I'm going to try to see if we can do a better information campaign to let parents know that because we certainly want them here to see uh, what their children are doing. Mrs. Watkins, have I forgotten anything? Okay. Um, she doesn't think so. She'll remember after I'm done uh, whatever I forgot. And so anyway, just uh, letting you know about those things that are going on. So, so Mark, let's sing, let's sing a couple more songs here. All right. Turn to page number 242, 242. <clears throat> Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus 
Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Okay, turn to page 258 and stand up. There is a name I love to sing. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. When tells me of the Savior's love who died to set me free. The sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me what my father had in store for every day and though i tread the darksome path his sun shine all the way oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus because he first loved me it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe who in each sorrow bears the part that none can bear below oh how i love jesus oh how i Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. And what a wonderful thing when you think about that. Somebody goes, nobody loves me, and go, you're wrong. Jesus loved you first, and, and he hasn't stopped loving and what a wonderful thing that is. Please turn in your Bibles tonight. Remain standing. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. Book of Matthew, uh, chapter 19. And uh, this is going to be a passage of Scripture that some of us have uh, read before. I'm really scrutinizing this passage tonight. And uh, not, not reading uh, necessarily in between the lines, but I am reading the lines and, and there's something really, really important uh, to grasp hold of here. And um, the question, I think, for every single one of us is, will we take God at his word? That is a very important question to think about. And uh, do we look at God's ability to work miracles as a thing of the past or a thing of the present? Because there are things that show that God's miracles are still a thing of the present, and, and especially when it comes to people. Matthew chapter 19, I'm looking at verse 16. It says, And behold, one came, and I'm going to stop here. I'll give a description of that one who came in a moment, because this is one of the few uh, passages that is included in every single gospel. Many times, uh, you'll have uh, passages, and they're either included only in Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which they call the synoptic gospels, and, they'll, and then you'll have John, and John will have accounts that do not exist at all in even Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This one is in all four. Important. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, 
What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And for those who need a simplification, don't lie. Honor thy father and thy mother. I want you to notice it doesn't say honor thy father or thy mother. It says honor thy father and thy mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, which interestingly enough is not part of the Ten Commandments. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we, we scrutinize uh, your word tonight and we look at it carefully and we examine it and we examine our hearts and we examine uh, the current state of our country and the current state of our families and even the current state of ourselves. And we begin to ask questions and we begin to have wonders and we begin to have doubts. I pray that we would accept your word as preeminent and that we'd accept your word as absolute truth and we would understand who you are and what you were able to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I was a young preacher in Stevensville, Montana. I know for some of you that look at me, you go, Pastor, I don't know how there could ever have been a time you were young. Uh, but I was. I, uh, I was. Uh, I find this hard to believe. I, I, I'm almost embarrassed to tell my wife. I was 40 pounds lighter. I was 40 pounds lighter. And I had lots of hair, huge amounts of hair. And, um, and I still had my mustache, so it was a different color. Now my mustache was about the color of Benjamin's hair over there. And, uh, and I had energy, and, uh, but I was a young preacher. And there have been certain aspects of, uh, of ministry with my wife and I that have been the same. And one thing that has always been the same, we've always loved children. And we've always desired to reach children, whatever ministry we're in, whether it be a senior pastor or even an assistant pastor. We loved children. And somehow I had a conversation uh, with a pastor in the region who knew other pastors in the region. And he, and, he, and he said to me, well, don't talk to pastor so-and-so who pastors over in thus and such. And I said, why wouldn't I talk to him about this and talk to him about children and talk about salvation and stuff? And he says, well, that pastor does not give the gospel to children because he does not believe that children can understand the gospel and be saved. And, and it kind of took me aback that anybody would really think that and and of course, uh, it might not surprise you, but that particular pastor in that particular town 
um, his church wasn't growing. And the next thing I know, I got a letter, and that pastor says, I'm going to be a missionary to the Russians. And, of course, you know, I didn't say anything. I didn't respond good or bad. But I'm thinking in my mind, if you're not going to reach Americans, how are you going to reach Russians? And, of course, uh, this was at a particular time when the Iron Curtain was down. You could actually get into Russia. And uh, I do know that he left his ministry there. Go, Pastor, did he ever get to Russia? I have no earthly idea. I never heard about him again. But I was just kind of amazed by that. That pastor had a personal limitation. He was limited in himself as far as what he believed God could do. And this is something we all face. You know, do we believe in a God that rises or descends to our level of expectation? Or do we believe in something more? The title of tonight's message is this, Continuing to Believe in the Miracle. Continuing to Believe in the Miracle. And in many ways, when we look at this passage in Scripture, this is an educational process that Jesus is taking his disciples through. And God gives us clues in the process that help us realize what God is able to do even when God himself claims there is incredible difficulty dealing with the heart of man. But difficulty does not mean impossibility. And so I want us to look at a few things here. First of all, let's look at the passage. Look at verses 16 and 17 again. And we're talking about, it just says one came. And one of the things that you'll discover, if you look at all four passages, is you'll discover that this is a rich, young man. And of course, this is in a different era. This is a, this is a different day. This isn't somebody who's credit card rich. I mean, you know, I have a lot of possessions because I have Visa, I have MasterCard, and I have payday loans. It's not that type of thing. This man genuinely had great possessions. And not only was he a rich young man, but the scripture shows quite clearly he was a rich young ruler. And it could have been even that being a rich young ruler, that he may have been a Jewish leader, may have even been a Jewish religious leader. The commentators doubt that he was a rich Roman leader. They just don't believe that would be the case. But we do have that scripture makes clear that this is a person who literally uh, has developed some authority. A picture like a, a super young CEO of a corporation, like maybe a dot com. And you know, uh, we see this sometimes. We see the bigger they are and the harder they fall. And there was some young, young guy and he was just all of a sudden became instantly um, uh, filthy rich in the Bitcoin dot com boom. And all of a sudden, I mean, the... Uh, his stocks just soared like this. Uh, now, I will tell you, they plummeted equally as fast. Uh, but it's amazing, you know, there is the capacity for young people to get very, very rich. And you can see it happen here. It can happen at other times. But what's interesting about this is this, this uh, young, rich man was also a religious man. But he made a significant doctrinal mistake when he talked to Jesus in this sense. He said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? To which Jesus' next question is, Why callest thou me good? In many ways he's saying, Are you really thinking about what you're saying? And then he said this, there is none good but one, that is God. In other words, Jesus is questioning this young man and, and he's saying, do you really know what you're talking about? And by the way, by Jesus saying this, he's also saying this, this is God's view of mankind. So this is the first point to understand. Man is certainly limited. 
And go, good is not a word that God uses of man. Of any man. And you know, now it is a word that man likes to use of himself or sometimes likes to use of other people, but it is not a word that God ever uses when he is talking about mankind. And we have in, in Romans, uh, quite simply in, in Romans chapter 3, looking at verse 10, we have God's opinion of man. And I was talking to a visitor this morning, and one of the things that I was talking about, we are talking about the Bible and, uh, and, I, and I was talking about how the Bible is a book that could not be written by man because no man would write it. Because man is always going to write a book that makes some man look good. Whether it'll make him look good or some other man look good, the Word of God does not make man look good. Man would never write such a book. It's important to think about. So here's what it says. As it is, is written, there is None righteous, no, not one. It doesn't even go to say there's few righteous. It says there's none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. It means it's like saying the whole lot of them. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So man is certainly limited because man cannot be good. And that is a major obstacle when you think about it. God says man is not good and man cannot be good. And so when this young man said good master, he says, okay, what are you saying? Because no man is good, so what are you saying here? If you're calling me good master, are you calling me good master because you really know who I am? Or are you calling me good master because you're not thinking about what you're saying, you're just trying to butter me up? And here's the thing. Sin is an obstacle. The Bible says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Sin is the obstacle and the human price for sin is insurmountable. No man can pay for his sins. And so man is certainly limited. That's the first thing to get out of the way. And man's limitations result in human impossibilities. Let us continue to read here. Let's look at, um, let's look at verse 21 here. And what is interesting about God is, is if we ever get full of ourselves, we ever begin to think we're somebody, God knows how to get that air out of, out of our balloons. Look at verse 21. Jesus said unto him, after they had a discussion regarding commandments and obeying commandments and, and looking at the scriptures and obeying the scriptures, Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect. And I'm going to stop here, and I want you to talk about a few other parallel passages here. And I believe it is the book of Mark where it says, Jesus beholding him loved him. I want you to think about that. In other words, Jesus, I mean, the guy already had done a swing and a miss when he said good master because he didn't know what he was talking about. And Jesus knew he didn't know what he was talking about. But it says Jesus beholding him loved him. He did not look at the man as insincere. And sometimes we're equally sincere, but we have a problem. We have, we have limitations. It says, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Notice it didn't say he had possessions. It said he had great possessions. And maybe we should turn that around and say the rather the great possessions had him. But he didn't realize that until that moment. And what happened is, Christ exposed the young ruler's limitations. He says, you've got a handicap, and you've had a problem. He says, 
If you can do this, you'll be able to turn things around. But the man went away. And then Christ declared the human impossibility. And notice, it got worse and worse as it went on. It says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so at one point he's saying, it's very, very difficult. But then he goes on, he says this, And again I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, and by the way, this is recorded in every single passage of Scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The disciples said this, that they were exceedingly amazed or astonished or astonished beyond measure. And every single time they said, who then can be saved? They were literally saying, if a rich man can't be saved, then who can be saved? You've got to run that around in your head. And, I, and I'm here to tell you this, the human impossibility. And, um, and that is, before there was TBN, before there was Benny Hinn, before there were televangelists, before there was a success gospel on television, there was a success gospel 2,000 years ago among the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And uh, what they were preaching was riches equal godliness and riches equal God's acceptance. And so if you are rich, you're accepted by God. And of course, there are a few reasons they were saying that. They're saying if you're rich, you're accepted by God. And what they're really saying is, well, if you're rich, you're really accepted by me because I really want some of that, is what they're saying. And Jesus exposed the false doctrine of the entire setup. But what is interesting is it was such a popular doctrine that even the disciples had bought into it. So as soon as they heard that a rich person, which in their mind was blessed of God, couldn't be saved, they're looking at each other going, nobody can be saved. And indeed, even Jesus gives the impossibility, think about this, in Matthew chapter 6, looking at verse 24. In Matthew 6, verse 24, Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. And if God says no man can do it, then God is saying it's impossible. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And Jesus had split that doctrine wide open with this rich young ruler, and literally the rich young ruler was an object lesson of the teaching of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It was okay, you want to see a living, breathing example of what I taught you a while before, there it is. And the man, he was sincere, he talked to Jesus, but he had riches, or should we say the riches had him. He wheeled on his heel and left, and Jesus says, do you see it now? Do you see the impossibility. Do you sometimes sense an impossibility here? Sometimes you look at things going on in our country and, and, and maybe you look at people fly a multicolored flag which interestingly is missing the colors red, white, and blue. They're not in that flag. And, um, and you go and you say, God, I think that's impossible. I don't think that can possibly happen. Though if you were to go to our track rack, you'll see a saved man who's a saved evangelist who was in that situation and was in that supposedly impossible snare. Do you sometimes think America's impossible to save? Do you believe that in your mind? And, and do you just talk about America saying, well, God can't do this? Do 
you sometimes say that about a particular loved one? Do you have a loved one that's particularly a hard nut to crack? In fact, you're pretty sure that that hard nut, nut is just basalt rock. And, and you go, the heart is of stone. And by the way, it's interesting in the Old Testament because when, when God talked about the Israelites, he says, you all have hearts of stone. He says, but I can take the stony heart out and give you a flesh heart. He says, I can do that. Do we sometimes look at our loved ones and look at our circumstances, and especially when we look at people? And let me put it this way. The easiest things for me to deal with in the ministry are things of organization and facility. Those are the easiest things. The hardest things to deal with in the ministry are people. It is. And um, each one of you have your particular hard person ministry project. Each one of you have one or more or many. And sometimes you go, it's impossible. Well, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, Christ declares the God of possibility. And he says, but Jesus beheld them. And what it means by this, why would this be in Scripture? It doesn't say that Jesus answered them. It says Jesus beheld them. And what this literally means is the disciples said to him, who can be saved? And what it literally means is Jesus wheeled and gave them a long look. He beheld them. He gave them a long look. It wasn't like he was talking as he was going, and it wasn't a quick answer. He stopped, and he looked at them long enough for the silence to grow so that everybody was paying attention. And then he said, with men... This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He literally stopped. Sometimes we get speaking too fast. And by the way, that's a problem with preachers all over the country, present company included. I mean, I'm preaching, I always have a second thought. Sometimes I get them scrambled, and that's why I can't understand anything I say. Because all of a sudden I'm skipping words, and, and, uh, and sometimes I miss things. Because I'm always a, a step ahead in the process but sometimes we have to stop and we have to look at a critical spiritual issue head-on and stop and scrutinize and think about it and Jesus gave them time to pause while he paused and then he said with men this is impossible and in, in many ways he's saying I understand what you're saying. And I understand what you're thinking. And he says, but with God, all things are possible. So in the, the three points we're presenting tonight, first of all is understanding. Man is certainly limited, present company included. In man's limitations result in human impossibilities. And sometimes it becomes such a great human impossibility that when we hear another miracle happen somewhere else, we go, oh, that didn't really happen. They must be padding the numbers or they must be exaggerating because it's a miracle. And we've got to the point in our lives we don't believe in miracles anymore. But Christ declares the God of possibility. And this is the important thing to understand. Only God can save man. And only God can change man. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Salvation is not an act of man. Salvation is an act of God. Man's only part in salvation is calling out to the God of miracles when they realize they need a miracle in their lives. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why did they call upon the name of the Lord? Because they became aware of their limitations. And they became aware of the impossibility of salvation apart from God. It is impossible 
for anybody to be saved apart from God. And every person individually must come to that place in their own lives where they realize without God, it is impossible for me to be saved. So only God can save or change a man. And I want to say this. I now want to work through the passage backward. And I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that Jesus said, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And there have been many pastors who preached sermons that said, bless God, this man, he was addicted to his riches, and he's burning in hell to this day because he did not turn back to God. But I want you to notice something. And this is what I believe. Looking at this passage, I believe there is hope for the young ruler. Go, Pastor, why? He didn't go away angry. And when a man is proud, and a man is committed to his course, and somebody says to them, you need to change their course, they stiffen up. And they wheel on their heel. And they don't leave sorrowful. They leave proud. And they leave, and they leave angry. This rich young ruler left grieved. He literally collided head on with the will of Almighty God. And thinking he was on the right side of things, he found himself on the wrong side of things. And he went away sorrowful because at that one moment in time, he realized that he didn't have things. Those things had him. Does every rich ruler go to hell? Oh, turn with me. To Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. Matthew 27, verse 57. This is right after Jesus died on the cross. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea, named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. By the way, when you go to a governing official and you ask for something, you're usually going to have to be something before you're able to ask for something. So I'm thinking Joseph of Arimathea was more than just a rich man. In order for a governor to listen to him, he must have been more than just somebody who had money. It had to also be somebody who had some influence. So he was not just a rich man. He must have been mm, a rich ruler. He went to Pilate, begged the body of Jesus. Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. He rolled a great stone to the door of sepulcher and departed. Now, proof of God's power. Who was the rich young ruler? Do you want to know? So do I. Could have been a rich ruler named Joseph of Arimathea? Maybe. Some church tradition puts it this way. Remember how in the book of John, John never really mentions himself in the book of John. He's just a disciple who Jesus loved. 
There are some that argue that in the book of Mark that was written by John Mark, that maybe there was a rich young ruler who didn't mention who he was in the gospel that God commissioned him to write. And so there's some who wonder if it was John Mark. And I will give you an absolute, dogmatic, unequivocal, I don't know. But I would not be surprised if there's a man that I can meet in heaven who had the title of rich young ruler. Because Jesus said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. What can God overcome? There was a preacher in Montana who said, I don't think that eight-year-old boys could be saved. I'm an eight-year-old boy who got saved. And some men would think this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now that's an eight-year-old boy. What about an 89-year-old man set in his ways, having lived his entire life against God, you know, uh, even uh, even telling one of his grandsons, well, I don't believe in that. I believe we're all like dogs and we just go into the grave and rot. That wasn't me. That was my grandfather talking to my younger brother who was witnessing to him. And I prayed for my grandfather for years. But in the back of my mind, I thought, just letting you know, confessing, back of my mind I thought, this is impossible. Until the phone call came, and I found out that my grandfather literally got up from a back aisle and walked to the front when an evangelist was in a church and receive Christ as his personal Savior. And it's because with God, all things are impossible. If there is one thing, one great encouragement that I could give to each one here in the congregation, no matter what you've been through, and that is don't stop believing in the miracle. Don't stop believing in what God can do. Because I'll tell you what, people are hard nuts to crack. Me too. But with God, all things are possible. And that is a pretty good thing to think about as we go into a vacation Bible school. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, As we look at what you say, we can see that you said it. But I ask, do we believe it? And I confess before you, Lord, it is so easy to believe things when the belief is convenient. But when the belief is so terribly, terribly hard, are you still that God? As Elisha cried out to you and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And found out that you're still a God of miracles. And as you in the person of Jesus Christ beheld these disciples and said all things are possible with you. Help us to not stop believing in what you were able to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we stand, the song is number 306.
and is the song that makes so much sense considering what we've discussed. It says, only believe. Only believe. And sometimes we have to get to the end of our rope so God can throw us a new rope. Let's stand as we sing. 306. The altar is open. You may want to pray for vacation Bible school. You may want to pray for a loved one. You may want to pray for God's help, even with faith. Let's sing, and you come while we sing. Fear not, little flock, from the cross to the throne, from death into life, he went for his own. All power in earth, all power above, is given to him for the flock of his love. Only believe, only believe, all things are possible. Oh,